Hi, good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> Yo! How's it going? Oh, Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. Good to connect with you. How cool is that? I'm like, who should I talk to? Everyone says Edgar. And now talking <laughs> to you. This is, this is how the world is created. Yeah, it's all through connections, all through, yeah, through the beautiful networks and webs that we're a part of. Well, you know, this is the awkward period where we wait for people to show up. But just to start, since it's recorded, this is Let's Talk Digital Alternatives. I'm Nato Thompson. My guest today is Edgar Fabian Frias. Is that how I say it? Yeah, that's perfect. I didn't know. You never know. Um, I'm stoked to talk to you. Congratulations on your MFA. Thank you. Yeah, it's just been like about a little over a week and a half since I've graduated. Still feels surreal. I feel like I'm still processing <laughs> what it means to be a graduate from UC Berkeley and to have my MFA now. And that's, you've already coupled that with an MA. So your MFA is on top of an MA. You have a, well, let me do an intro to you officially. Yeah. And then we will, we will go. I got your little, I'm on your website. I also like got my booster shot yesterday and I'm like, my brain's a little soupy, but I think I might actually be good. It is actually going to make me more associative. All right. Edgar Fabian Frias works in installation, photography, video art, sound, sculpture, printed textiles, GIFs, performance, social practice, and community organizing, among other forms. You know, that just says to me, you're willing to take on anything, which is good. Frias, how do you say this? Wixarica? Yeah, yeah, it's Widarica. Widarica. All right, we're yeah. going to get into the Widarica. And their family is from Mexico, though they have lived in the United States and most of their life. Their art addresses historical legacies and acts of resistance, resiliency, and radical imagination within the context of indigenous futurism, spirituality, play, pedagogy, animism, and queer aesthetics. Love all this. Good, good stew. Weaving, weaving together the traditional and ancestral with the contemporaneous and emergent. Born in 1983 in East Los Angeles, Frias received a BA in psychology and studio art from you see Riverside behind the orange curtain, if you will. In 2013, received an MA in clinical mental health counseling at Portland State University. Oh my God, how crazy is your pedigree? And then uh, with an emphasis on interpersonal neurobiology and somatic psychotherapy. That's a mouthful, huh? That's awesome. Free has received their MFA in art practice from UC Berkeley in 2022. Welcome to the show. How cool are you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Nato. Really appreciate this introduction and just really grateful to be here and to connect with you. And so happy to see Sarah Moosby here too, who connected us. So happy that you're here with us as well, Sarah. Sarah, thank you. You're so awesome. And um, yeah, shout out. To, oh, yeah, cool. Heart, heart, hands, heart, hands high. Hearts, hands high. Um, you know, the thing I was thinking too is I feel like life could just be a, a world where we all interview each other in a circle. And, uh, and that's called making the world meaningful. Let's start with, I want to like, just take a back step. I want to talk about, um, your kind of magical practice. I want to talk about art. I want to talk about the confluence. I want to talk about, um, you as, you know, getting your MFA and also just, you know, navigating the world as you do. But first let's start with Edgar growing up in East Los Angeles and what got you into the arts in the first place what your point of entry into this com complicated, interesting uh, background you have. Yeah, so um, I would say it's been very led and guided. Um, I love connecting with kind of spiritual, ancestral energies. And I feel like since I was a young person, they've yeah. been kind of leading me in different directions. And art is so interwoven with this. Um, I didn't really see contemporary art until I was about 14. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a small town. I, I was born in East LA, and then I moved to a small town in the Inland Empire. And um, my parents never really took us to art museums. And so when I yeah. was 14, 
I went to LACMA for the first time, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and I got to see some contemporary art for the first time, and it really blew my mind. And I remember specifically being in front of a piece by Edward Keenholz and Mm -hmm. just having one of my first experiences of an altered state of awareness where I really felt something opening, like a portal. I just really felt confused and disoriented, but also really excited and titillated and was like, I need to know what this art thing is. And uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> so the same day, my um, when I got home, my mom took me to the library. And um, what's interesting is this library is in downtown Riverside. And uh-huh. as soon as I walked in, I was like, I'm gonna go look for the art section. But before I even got to the art section, there was a big uh, monograph of Andy Warhol's art that was just like on the table by itself. And that was kind of like the the beginning and the opening where I learned who Andy Warhol was and Marcel Duchamp. And that was also what really got me into psychology too, because then I learned about surrealism and Lacan and Freud and Jung. And so it really, I feel like psychology, art and magic have all kind of been really woven together for me since I was a young person. So that, I mean, uh, everyone knows their first intro to art, whether it's a show or a book, they really lead a massive impression. And Keinholz, of all the people, because they did these kind of crazy installations, which I feel like my first introduction to art was like Disneyland. You know? <laughs> like, I was like, like you know, that's kind of like installation art, like Pirates of the Caribbean or something. Right, like, totally. Like, like yeah, Keinholz performance, those, too. <laughs> yeah, performance, like outfits, costumes. I was always like, but but Keenholz had was it one of those big installations with like a car and like stuff everywhere? And it was recall. literally that piece, the uh, the piece with the car that I was in front of. Oh my god! And you were just like, "What is this?" Now, in terms of you know the more spiritual, ancestral magic meets I don't know indigenous practice. Was that always in the house, or was that something you discovered outside of the house? It was, you know, a little bit of both. I grew up Jehovah's Witness, so I grew up pretty religious um, within a pretty conservative Christian community. Uh Um, I grew up in a, like, immigrant community. uh, My church was Spanish-speaking only. And I would say that, like, witchcraft and magic were all seen as really pagan or evil. And it wasn't until I, I studied abroad when I was at UC Riverside, and I went to England. And when I was in Leeds in northern England, I met a bunch of, like, radical queer anarchists who were all living in like squatted houses and abandoned places and they were all like witches and so it was really it's really the queer community and the trans community that really introduced me to witchcraft and magic and it wasn't until later on when I got into my 30s that um, after I'd been practicing divination and doing spell work that my dad actually um, finally told me that, like, that's something that's a part of our indigenous ancestry. But it was something that he had never really spoken to me about. Yo, I mean, I have to say, first of all, sounds like that place in Leeds made quite an impression on you. You were just like, were you just like, sign me up? (laughs) <laughs> definitely yeah it, it was people living in a, such a different way you know growing up in southern california i had never known people who were like living in houses that were abandoned and like oh, people were really poly and there was like a big sex dungeon and it was a very different way of living and it was very impactful for me and one of the big memories i have from the program was i ended up creating a performance as part of my um, work that i was doing at the university of leeds and we ended up having this performance in an abandoned nunnery and it was a, like a queer like a festival that they were throwing at this abandoned nunnery and the, while i was performing the police was like trying to like bang down the door to get inside and so that that was really just like this moment of just like being in the liminal, being in a place of precarity, but also so much excitement and potentiality too. Yeah, yeah, I can totally feel that. And um, and you know, just to kind of touch on that because I, it's so funny, you know, I graduated from Berkeley too, but a million years ago, and I actually went there and lived in this co-op called Chateau, but it was like total like radical gender bending uh, anarchist house so it was also a very drug friendly house um but it was kind of why i went to berkeley and i didn't realize most of the people there were just career aspiring boring people uh, (laughs) because it wasn't why i went there um but just to say the introduction 
to a different way of being in the world, not just like a art practice per se, because that wasn't it. It was like a different way of inhabiting life. I think that's really profound. It seems like that's what you encountered in Leeds. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what, you know, I grew up really conservative and also grew up very, you know, obviously very entrenched in this idea of capitalism and yeah. this the, the things that we're all force fed growing up. And yeah, and to see people living in a different way and existing in a different way, it does really make you start to self-reflect and really look at so many different aspects of your life. So when was that? Let's just put some time on that. So that was in 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. when I was studying abroad in England. So let's just, and then let me ask you also a thing about your relationship to like a cult or witchcraft or what have you. I'm not sure what the right, what do you call that? What's the word you use? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I say spirituality, witchcraft, paganism. There's so many, okay. so many ways you can call it. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know. You know, I always imagine some people are really stern about their terms and some people are pretty loose. You know I'm pretty I mean? loose, yeah. I'm I'm pretty <laughs> fluid, and I also I also let, love the word animism too. Uh, I yeah, think animism is really powerful and magical to talk about. That's nice. So, but since you had this kind of conservative religious background, did that stuff scare you at all? I mean, I remember when I was in high school and I listened to an album of Slayer, and I was like, "Oh my God, I'm totally going to hell for listening to this." <laughs> Um, but certainly there was, you know, I mean, paganism does come with some fear around it, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I would say that, um, I grew up listening to like hard house. I grew up in uh -huh. Southern, Southern California, listening to a lot of techno and hard house. And even that music was considered demonic. And I had people like approach me at my church and talk to me. And I think, you know, being queer was one of those things that like when I was 15, I had a moment where I realized like, oh, I'm different than a lot of people. And that difference might mean that I'm going to get kicked out of my church and I might even get kicked out of my family. And so I feel like that was a moment, even sure. though it was really like overwhelming, it also was a moment where I really like had to kind of draw upon my own inner resources and also kind of look around and be like, how can I create connections outside of these um, systems that might reject me at some point. And th that was like what gave me that courage to start to explore other realms. Uh -huh. But I would definitely say I had a lot of noise around as what you're saying, like paganism is evil, uh, even queerness is evil. Yep. There was so much that I had to unlearn in order to move more towards like the realms that I exist in right now. Well, so... You know, I mean, I think <laughs> it's kind of like it's 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 one of the, the cool thing about being queer is it upends a lot of things, which is great. Everything goes upside down. Right. <laughs> and so, um, but was your family supportive? Of, was that difficult for you, too? And, 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 and furthermore, how much of a support network with your friends or your, your you know, like your community um, growing in high school and stuff where, where did you have? So I was like pretty like closeted, I would say, yeah. until I got into like university. And it wasn't until I went to Leeds to England that I would like really came out. Mm -hmm. And um, my family is, you know, I, it took them a moment. They've been supportive. They never like kicked me out, but it was hard for them. It took them a few years to finally be able to talk about my queerness. And um, I feel like it definitely has made me feel alienated from my family and I've had to really rely on these other networks. But I think, yeah, like I, I very quickly found other queer and trans people at, even in high school and started wow. hanging out with them. And we start to go to events together, go to art museums together, but it was very much still on the hush hush, you know, I can imagine. So you go, so long, just, so, you know, when you get back from Leeds, just to kind of swirl around with this, at what point were you like, I'm trying to, you know, so you go, you know, you get a master's in like clinical psychology. So you weren't, I'm just guessing. I'd like to get, I always love hearing the art, like at what point you decided you wanted to be an artist or whatever, because it's not an easy choice to come to, but where did, you know, like, where did the psychology thing come? Were you like battling between like, what do I want to do with my life? Or how did that all end up after you get back from Leeds and you're at yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. So when I was an undergrad at UC Riverside, I started with psychology and psychology has always been a passion of mine. And it also was because my family, my family didn't want me to go to college. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are really anti-education, um, higher education, mm. because they believe it strays you away from the church. Um, which it does, <laughs> because when you learn about the world, you realize, like, 
you know, a lot of things that you learned growing up maybe aren't exactly the way they've been told to you. Yeah. And um, I would say that, you know, when I moved to Portland, I moved to Portland after Leeds and I, you know, started to work as like a parapsychology person. I was working with families and uh-huh. I really started to kind of feel like healing was a path for me. And I had also uh-huh. received some messages while in the art program at Leeds that I needed to move into healing work. Uh-huh. And I would say that I've never stopped being an artist. Even while I was at uh, Portland State University in the uh-huh. M- MA program, I was also organizing a queer and trans music and arts festival there. And so I've always kind of had my like, you know, fingers and toes dipped in the art world somehow. And, you know, I think once you're bitten by that art bug, it's so hard to let it go. So um, yeah. I, I would say it's something I've always tried to cultivate and keep in my life. Well, you know, we both share one thing, which I really, we share many things, but I always felt like for me, the arts was a lifestyle. It wasn't a vocation. Right. I was like, totally. I just hate weirdos. Is that a job? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like, like it just tended to be they were artists. I didn't, I didn't go out looking for it that way. It was just they lived the most interesting lives. It tended to be. I've always felt like the arts is a kind of catch-all for people that just are like, like if you're an anti-careerist, maybe you're an artist. If you don't believe in capitalism, maybe you're an artist. You know, if you're trans and queer, you're definitely got some artiness in you. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And I feel like we're drawn to each other. Like I've had that experience so many times. I've lived in so many different cities and every time I've gone to a new city, I feel like just like moths to a flame, we like find each other and we're like, next thing you know, you're organizing an exhibition together, you know? <laughs> totally. So you, but you know, let me just ask to, when you got your, I know you were doing arts the whole time, but did you imagine, and maybe you still do a kind of a plan of going into clinical psychology? Cause it is a gig, you know, like that's a job. Yeah, I worked for over a decade as a therapist in different capacities. Um, I did have a private practice for a moment, but, um, and I've worked in many different ways with people, like in group therapy, individual therapy. And I was like thinking of that, you know, and I did have to make a choice when I finished my master's program because I was going to start a private practice at that time. Mm -hmm. But I decided to move to California and to kind of start over and... I think that's what really kind of led me in that direction of like having having a moment where, you know, after working for years as a therapist, as a social worker, where I really was like, you know, I'm I cannot let go of this art passion of mine. It is a lifestyle. It's a way of relating to the world that I'm not going to stop. And so um, it wasn't until I moved to Los Angeles that I really started to. Um, take it seriously and really see it as a career, as a potential to make money and to sustain myself um, alongside of it, of, of course, being something that I'm really passionate about, too. So I did this show at Mass Mocha. I don't even know where you're. Uh, what was it? Um, uh, 2006. Got it. Um, it was called The Believers. And it was a show about people that make art by that comes out of a belief system rather than, I don't know like a removed kind of art, you know what I mean? And certainly magic played a fundamental role because of course, you know, people in, in the spirit of animism, it's kind of like, it's hard to call it art in the same way because it's part of a practice. It's, it's, it's living, it's mutating, it's in connection with other people. You know, this converse and, and, you know, my feeling is contemporary art often is such a modernist Western tradition in many ways. And it's, it often has this kind of uh, disposition of being rather, what'd you say, like uh, agnostic or, you know, if, if not simply atheistic? Um, how do you, you know, when you started thinking about, you were introduced to these different practices, how do you, when did you start, which, which one gets priority and how do you resolve these kind of, if not tensions, dynamics within what you do? Yeah, you know, I, I really, I'm glad you bring this up because I feel like when I first started looking into spirituality and art, I was still in Portland, Oregon. And I remember feeling like such a weirdo at the time because I was wanting to do art projects that were around like witchcraft or spell work. Maybe I didn't have that language at the time. Uh-huh. I, I even once collaborated with a witch in Portland on like a group, like a group therapy experience that we saw as art practice and it took a while to like really convince people, you know, that that was like a thing. Um, But it wasn't until I would say um, moving to Los Angeles that I started to meet so many other art witches, people who um, 
we're really exploring what it means to be a multidimensional person and to have many sides of your practices that feed into each other. And yeah, and I feel like I definitely am so grateful to learn about my Indigenous um, ancestry because I feel like I finally have started to see other communities that don't really regiment these practices so much and that really do have a way where practices, you know, blend and mutate and grow into each other where you can have something that is performance and art and ritual and healing and therapeutic and also community organizing. It's all of it at once. And I think um, seeing other people work in that way has been really inspiring for me. And I feel like there are a lot of folks who like now are really dissolving some of these regimentations through their practices. And that's been really exciting for me. And I would say, though, of course, as you could imagine, I have run across, uh, you know, what I what I like to call like non-believers or people who uh-huh. really um, believe in the like Western, um, you know, mechanistic system and have really like invested in that. And, you know, just to give you an example, uh, when I was at Portland State University, I was I got a certificate in interpersonal neurobiology and This field is a field that is based in hard science, like neuroimaging research with MRIs and, you know, different like actual machines that are taking computations. And at the same time, this field of research is really looking at an interdependent relational universe and trying to create science around that. But because of that, because it's not mechanistic and regimented, it is seen as like not real science by a lot of people. Even at Portland State University, there were a lot of people who called it like the hippie department or like the the woo-woo department, even though I'm like, this is based in like MRIs. Like these are actual machines and and actual research that's being done. But because it's not within that paradigm, it really, um, a lot of people just like reject it outright. You know, it's wild. So I've become really into psychology lately, therapy, maybe because I'm in therapy a lot. (laughs) But like, so I was reading about Freud, right? So, you know, Freud is like, you know, they called it initially psychoanalysis. They called it the speaking cure and the ability to talk out loud was ability to process what was going on in your mind. And that, you know, um, Jung, just to be brief, Carl Jung, who studied under Freud, began to bring up these ideas of archetypes and, and also what is actually the predecessor of psychoanalysis, which was like hypnotism, magnetism, fiat. Theosophy, like all this kind of, there's a mystical deep thread between contemporary psychological studies and and the tradition of mysticism as ways of unlocking the subconscious. But of course, Freud wanted to bury it because he felt like it would make people dismiss it as being kooky. And it sounds like the same thing happens in the department in Portland State today. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And I think even, you know, getting my master's in clinical mental health counseling, like, I had to really advocate to be even quote unquote, allowed to do somatic psychotherapy, because even, you know, I think at this moment, it's very now understood that somatic psychotherapy is a real practice, and that it like, makes sense in psychology that, you know, to incorporate the body into psychology really makes sense. But it still was a little fringe, not as fringe as it was maybe 10 years ago, but I did still have to advocate to be like allowed to move into more um, holographic ways of understanding people um, because they were still very much based on the medical model, on the diagnosis model, on cognitive behavioral interventions. And so there is a way that there is almost like a hierarchy of value around um ontologies or systems of information. And I think that to me is something that as an artist and also as someone who traverses different realms, I find that kind of stuff really fascinating. And I, you know, being a trickster, I love to play with these things too, or push up against them. I think it's really important to have people who can do that because it is a belief or something that people put their faith or trust into. And I think, you know, questioning or expanding upon these uh, structures is really important for us to do. So I want to push you on some spiritualism, animism, magic stuff, if you don't mind, because Mm -hmm. I always feel like the dumb questions are really fun. First of all, everything is fun when it comes to magic. So we'll start there. But like, I feel like, let me just ask, like, A, you know, I I have two minds when it comes to magic. Sometimes I'm like, I'm way game for it. And sometimes I'm like, but that totally is not true. <laughs> I'm totally 
totally i find myself like on both ends of the spectrum sometimes like cause mm-hmm. sometimes it gets, some people get really corny and i'm like oh, i don't know about that but, like, <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless i want to ask you like in terms of like spells for example like how do you how do you square that like you you know and you kind of like there's a language around it that defies rationality do you take it as an, like how do you kind of think through that do you believe in spells do you cast spells how do you kind of frame that kind of practice yeah you know i i i find the the rational and irrational you know that like i think it's a very thin line or maybe non-existent line that exists between the two spaces and i'm very much someone who I choose to believe in magic. I choose to believe in my inner power as a human. I think that that's something that witchcraft has really uh, allowed me to step into is to really feel my agency, my ability to influence, to have um, some say, and to also be collaborative, to really ask and to ask for support to know that I'm not alone, that I can really um, reach out to other, you know, ancestors or to other plants or animals or people to really support me. And I've witnessed so many miracles happen as a result of that. And, you know, I've also had many experiences that before I even knew what witchcraft was, where I've had animals and plants speak to me. I've had Mm. crystals speak to me. And so Uh I'm someone who's been almost like, um, you know, I, I I have no choice but to believe because I've been almost just like, it's been like, um, I, not to say forced upon me, because that sounds like it was not consensual, even though it sometimes not maybe doesn't feel like it is. But it's just something that it has really been a big part of my experience as a, as a person. And so I've really been led in this way. And that's why I really do work a lot with ancestral energies, because I do really feel like a lot of us have ancestors who are trying to reach out to us or who are mm. providing little... Um, moments of insight or, you know, moments where they're trying to coax us in certain directions. And it can be really subtle or sometimes it can be really intense too. And and I think those are um, things that also defy logic. And, and I think, I guess, going back to this too, as someone who's worked in the therapeutic realm, I have experienced so many people who've come into therapy. I work, I used to work in treatment, which is um, in like a step down from, let's say, inpatient psych- psychiatry, which yep. sometimes people go there without um, their consent because they're forced to go there. And I would say there were so many people who were coming who were also having visions or who were having experiences that were outside of the rational, outside of what uh, capitalism teaches us is okay to experience. And it causes so much suffering when you don't have other frameworks to really understand what these messages can mean. And I think that's why it is so powerful to teach people about uh, these practices, about the legacies and histories, you know, and I think that's something that's really missing. And that's why a lot of people get terrified when they have these kinds of visions and don't know what they mean or have no way to contextualize them within their life. I mean, I, you know, I must say that I'm not smart enough to totally understand all of Felix and Guattari, Deleuze and Guattari. Right. But certainly I know that in A Thousand Plateaus or Schizoanalysis, they kind of, you know, I think Guattari worked in a clinic and was really interested in the power dynamics between the therapist and the patient. And, and, and also the ways in which the patient was, in some ways, they didn't have a spiritual read on it but was producing different kinds of realities that need to be paid attention to. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I think that that's, you know, I, you know, not to give away any information about a person, but I just remember there was a person who I worked with once who um, his, his parents were all bankers. They were, his mom and dad were bankers. And mm-hmm. this person would like literally sit in their room and channel the most like profound poetry and prose and writing and just, and they would get into an altered state of awareness and their parent, his parents are so mad that he didn't want to be a banker and that, and that he wasn't <laughs> interested in money. And so they like literally sent him to like psychiatric inpatient because of this. And, and, you know, he had no context over what was happening to him. And of course there were other elements involved too and stuff. But for me, it was so interesting to see when someone maybe has a gift or a capacity that doesn't fit into what the system maybe wants you to be, that that, you know, causes an issue, right? That creates a friction or a tension. And, and, and so I think that that, you know, and of course, as a therapist, I definitely 
had really thought a lot about that power differential and the and the way that you know I'm being seen when I'm like relating to other people and that's something that I think there is such a um, opportunity there to really validate people and also to not because I'm very much someone who doesn't want to like stigmatize people or put people into a box when it comes to like mental health because I feel like we're always mutating I think diagnosis is really helpful but also it can also become a trap too and so there are ways I think to talk about these um, experiences that we have um, to really open them up instead of really pathologizing them or making people feel disempowered I'm with you. Oh my God. I'm loving, I'm loving everything you're saying. It's making me crazy. <laughs> so, so let me just ask you, and we'll get to the art stuff. I keep putting it off, but I'll, we'll get to it. But like, I want to say, so I have a few friends, you know, I dabble with the cold stuff, but I'm like way noob. Um, but like, have you ever, my, my friends that are really into it, they, they say there's a point where they're kind of fascinated, they're curious, and then they realize it's way bigger and they get a little nervous. Yeah. Um, where like, it's, you know, they're kind of like, it's fun. It's, it's a game or they, they kind of take it like it's, it's joyful and pleasurable. It's fine. But then they get a little freaked out by the bigness of it. Has that happened to you or anything like that? Um, I would definitely say one thing that I've experienced is astral projection. Um, <laughs> I've had a few experiences um, where I've had friends who've been in crisis reach out to me and have just had their intuition tell them to reach out to me. And I've done a little bit of astral projection work and the things that have happened as a result of that have really made me um, want to receive more like training or support around it. Just because I realized like how big and how real these experiences are. Um, and that I don't feel like I have the, you know, the, I, the maybe the like understanding of, of its complexity and its bigness and, and its impact when you do it. And so that's something that I'm definitely as a witch want to learn more about, want to get more support around just because things that have happened have really freaked me out, you know, basically, because I'm just like, oh, my gosh, like I was really able to see this thing happen for you through this, you know, really quick moment because astral projection can happen in like a split second. And so yeah. to be able to receive that much information and that quickly to me is does feel like really big. And so it's something I want to like revere and understand better. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that's definitely one realm. But I think uh, other than that, there, I definitely lean into the joyousness, the the play, the imagination of magic. And, and um, I would say like, you know, really appreciate other witches who lean into that too. I'm so game. Um, so I went on your website and went through your myriad of cool projects, by the way. And congratulations on an immense body of work. And certainly a, a coherent thread through a lot of it is a kind of combination of performance, installation, um, and always, it seems to me, often a social kind of experience. Um, right. Not to not to typecast your, your genre. You're, you're very, you know, you've got a lot of, you got a lot of complexity in there. But it does seem like the communal kind of spirit in your work is, it, I, it really struck me. Um they almost like feel like ways in which you can be with people. One project that I, all, I mean, but you have a few, of, I mean, you've got video, we can talk, we're going to talk about NFTs too, because I'm very interested in the, it's a, it's called Let's Talk Digital Alternatives. Let's talk about <laughs> right. But like, uh, but I want to ask you, I was noticing this project, not to go too long on it, but it's the one where the person graffitied, where is this? Someone graffitied on your billboard. Um, which one was that? Hold on, I'm finding it. I am, is, this is what it is. I am enough. I am sovereign. In 2021? Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah. So in 2019, I made a billboard in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was an offering to my ancestors. And um, it was up for about a couple of months. And I was actually interviewed on television uh, by the local news there. And shortly after I was interviewed, someone, someone defaced it. And I had, you know, I was able to keep the, the piece. And I had kind of thought of never showing it again until I was approached by the curator of this exhibition at Southern Exposure, Ricky Dwyer. They approached me and started talking to me about um, the theme of the exhibition was to the ways that artists get get shaped by their material choices or the ways that their work kind of manifests. And so as we were talking, I started to think about how I've been moving from the digital realm 
or maybe the relational community yeah. organizing realm more into like physical art making, into public art making, and also becoming more of a public person too, and yeah. being met with like, you know, both a lot of like celebratory, exciting energies, but also being met with hate and online trolls and kind of dealing with that too. And so not we thought easy. that, sorry? Not easy. Not easy. Yeah, exactly. It's not easy being a public person. And <laughs> and so we felt like, you know, in speaking with this curator, like this piece really represented that. And so as a way to like reclaim its original intention, we were able to show it again. And I also uh, was able to do a ritual at the beginning of uh, the exhibition to kind of re reinscribe or re-imbue the energies into the piece. And it was actually the first time I performed since the beginning of the pandemic. So it also felt really important for that reason too um I, I watched the video of you performing and everyone's got their masks on and i just thought god man it's gonna be it's such a it's so beautiful to be both like i could feel the energy is what i want to say edgar like i could feel it and also like stepping out and and you know it must like when you when someone tagged over it you know it's so crazy what like how little energy it took to tag over your work and how much personal energy it took for you to to take that on um and the fact yeah. that you want to show it says to me that you were very wounded by that yeah no it was it was it was like embarrassing especially because like I had been really excited about it I'd gotten so much like praise and support and so like I didn't want to like bring that out again you know and but it took me some time to yeah to get to a place where I felt like you know I don't want to be ashamed of this this is part of my journey and and I don't want to like hide it but I also don't want to feel like it, they're allowed to control the narrative and I think like what you said is so true that it takes so little energy to criticize or to break down a person but to create is such a labor intensive process and does take so much um, vulnerability and courage to come out and to share your art in the world I think that that's something that, you know, as an artist, but also as someone who's really led people through the creation process, I, I see how vulnerable it is for us to share from our hearts. And so that's like why I really love that pro that practice and also why I feel so protective both of myself and of other artists in my life too. Oh my God, I'm so with you. You know, I've always, as someone that's done a lot of political art, I do this public art stuff and I always felt like I'd work for like a year and a half on a project and then just get like people tell me how problematic it is. Do you know what I mean? And or like the troll culture. And it really like I, it took me a long time to emotionally recover from it because I also feel like what makes people make great art is your ability to still be vulnerable. And yeah, it's a public world to be vulnerable in, you know? Um, yeah. You, you know, maybe that's the healing practice and your community. How do you keep yourself vulnerable? Like after that, how did you like be like, okay? They can't win. I've got to keep my tender heart, but still keep making and get out there again. Yeah, I think that's why it's really important to have like connections with, you know, artists that you really trust and that you can be your authentic self. Like there's a few folks here in the room like yeah. that I really feel like I trust here in this space. I'm so happy to see you all here, like Sarah Braun, like the both Sarah's and a couple of other folks here who are just like really supportive. And, and I think having these networks of resiliency are really um, important for us as people and to really continue to encourage each other to have a place where you can go process what happens. Like, I think that that is what um, really keeps us going is to have these like pockets of resiliency that you can kind of move into and care and, and connection and then be able to move back out into the world from that space. I mean, you know how like groups of friends can choose two different ways of being. You can have be the friends that are very competitive and always taking you down, or you can have the friends that are always trying to lift you up. And I sometimes have to like correct my friends to be like, hey, remember that deal we made to lift each other up? <laughs> <laughs> we like keep with that vibe. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I like to see like my <laughs> connections as like we're like an organism and the stronger my friends are the stronger I am and that we're because I really witnessed that especially uh, in the art community as well as in the witch community I really witnessed like how much we inspire each other how much we give each other permission to show up in different ways and also like how much we need each other to grow and to transform and to get our message out and so 
I'm very much on that side where I want to see my friends do well. I want to be excited and happy for them when they have success because I just, I've seen it happen where whenever I have a, a phrase that I like to say that I say a lot is your success is my success. My success is your success. We ascend together. And there's, yeah. it's like a mantra that I use to really kind of, you know, do away with that capitalist training that we all have, that we're individuals and that we have to fight each other for resources. It's always tricky. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of art groups, you know, like little scenes then out of a town like Providence, Rhode Island or Chicago. And like it's a tight new group of people and they really love each other. And then one of them gets super famous and it totally fucks everybody else up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because everyone gets weird. The, the, the dynamic gets weird, right? And also, too, like sometimes people make a lot of money. Another one doesn't. It can be tough. The art road can be tough. And I do know this. That it's Most people don't make a lot of money. And getting by as an artist is tough. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's really unstable. It's unsure. Um, there are moments of big wins and also moments of silence. You know, you yeah, you have to be really uh, ready to go into that flow and to be ready for to see what that flow is going to bring you. But I think it's also there are so such moments of excitement, too, that I think it does kind of keep us hooked, knowing that, you know, things do happen like we've all seen big things happen for us and but yeah that instability I think is is what keeps a lot of people out, out of it because you know a lot of people want to have stability in their lives and to know where their income's going to come from yeah it is it's really it, it, it's 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 trying but it is the journey so let me ask you what is um Edgar Frias up to these days what is, what's on your mind you graduated from you got your MFA put in your pocket um I want to talk about that. And then I also want to turn to your kind of foray into the um, digital NFT stuff too. Yeah. So I, you know, have a little bit of space in my life and I'm actually like, um, I've been quote unquote resting in these last few days. But by that, I mean, I've been like trying to catch up on like side projects that I yeah. like, have well, that's how you rest. Uh, to finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm, I'm going to be doing a residency in Los Angeles um, mm -hmm. in July, which I'm really excited about. I got accepted into like a biennial for next year that I'm going to be working on. And so um, I have some big projects that are kind of like um, coming up in the future that I'm really like excited about. And also because I've been in grad school, I have not been able to be as active as I would like to be in the NFT space. And so that's something that I am really excited is to have more time to actually be able to mint more work and to be more active in the incredible communities that I'm a part of here in the metaverse web three space how do you feel about it's so funny we use metaverse it's so annoying it's coined by facebook but uh but you know in terms of the space i love your energy it's so great and you know it's it's totally exploded recently but at the same time it's still very young in it's kind of dispositions and relationships so i'd love to know your feeling about like minting and, and the community that you're developing in the space and and also Maybe just as a thought, like, you know, your practice as a spiritual person, uh, connecting the dots with your practice in this space, it's it's rather unique. Yeah, you know, I'm really, really grateful for Sarah Zucker, who's actually in this space yeah. right now. She's Hi, really... Sarah. Hey, See Sarah. You in LA. <laughs> <laughs> she, I feel like she gave me the most amazing introduction into the space. She really um, was one of the first people that reached out to me and told me about NFTs, I remember when she first reached out, I was like, what is this? It's really hard to understand. But yeah. she, you know, was kind enough to sit me down and really talk to me about it. And one thing she really said, which has start, struck, with, struck with me, is that it's all about relationship building. It's all about making connections, just like the traditional art market. And I really have taken that to heart and have really found the most amazing connections here in the space. For example, I'm a part of a group called Crypto Queers that really supports each other and also have been really supportive of other projects like Agenda, Agenda Dao and also uh, the Queer Museum of Digital Art. There's some really empowering, magical projects that are being created in this space. And I think that that to me has been kind of where the magic kind of starts to really be seen is that we can really build these webs for each other. And I've witnessed like folks go from being unknown artists, having weird practices that 
maybe don't fit into what we think of when we think of NFTs and to really be elevated and celebrated and to have their work be collected by people all over the world. And I myself have never had my own art collected by like a museum yet, uh-huh. but it's now in the collections of hundreds and hundreds of people around the world. And I think that that's also been um, really empowering for me as an artist. And a lot of the spells, a lot of the like gifts and digital art that I've made in the last few years, I like before NFTs uh, didn't really have a place to kind of feel like they could exist because you know, some museums are excited about showing gifts. Not a lot are, I would say. Yeah. Um, and so to yeah. be able to like have a home for them and to also know that they're going to be on the blockchain and exist forever has been really inspiring. And I think as queer and trans people, many of us have really talked about how important it is to have our presence be um, existing here in this space, especially because as we all know, uh, people who are in Web3 know that like NFTs can sometimes be synonymous with a certain kind of person or a certain kind of practice. And so I think it's really important to have, you know, the weirdos <laughs> that I love so much that I'm a part of uh, really expanding that and forging pathways for each other so that we can all be inspired enough to really show our artwork in these spaces. I mean, I'm so with you and so funny because the... Um... The misperception of NFTs is so not like the perception of NFTs is so not you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Like public perception. I mean, and it's not that it's um, you know, the only thing I'd say is somewhat disconcerted to some degree, is it's such a it's such a mess, right? In there, in, in a beautiful, chaotic mess. But there are also like any kind of, you know, because DeFi. Like a lot of money. Like I was just thinking how much um how much cryptocurrencies gave birth to NFTs in other ways too. And there's kind of the speculation world, it you don't have any cultural scene that has that kind of origin story. Do you know right. what I mean? It's right. such a specific origin story, and it really infects the culture in a lot of ways. And for someone that's kind of anti-capitalist and comes from a community that's cognizant of these tensions. You know, it, it, there is something about not just rebranding, but also taking um, taking seriously some of the really problematic value systems that are rife in the space. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think I've had a lot of conversations with other artists about this and 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 and, you know, and I think in some ways, I think what's what's been really exciting about the blockchain and the space is that it everything is transparent. So a lot of these things are, are being seen. And I think that's also why it feels a bit um, triggering for folks in the traditional art market, because there is so much problematic stuff that happens behind the scenes. Opacity is such a big, you know, friend to the traditional art market that we don't see a lot of these deals and, or they're only found out about until years later. And I think that that transparency is something that, is allowing us to see these problematic relationships and dynamics and they're maybe being able to be called out more quickly or looked at more quickly. And, and of course it is like a threat to the way that like maybe things are, have been done for a long time in the traditional art market. And, and I think that's also like one thing that has like kind of really encouraged me to come into this space is that, you know, I feel like it, it's so it's so problematic to really feel like this space only exists for cis straight white men who yeah. are like rich and are able to like understand these technologies, like, because that's not the truth. Like there, I've seen so many folks of different genders and identities and from different countries become empowered by these systems. And I've seen these um, technologies being used for the most altruistic, supportive um, things. And so I think that, it really does give me that courage to continue in this space and to also not let it just be another place that gets colonized essentially by a certain group of people. Um, because I think that's also what is in danger of happening. If, you know, if everyone, you know, only believes that there's a certain kind of person that does NFTs, that's like a self-fulfilling prophecy right there too. Totally. Well, I mean, I must say, like, it, it's changed so much in the year. I, I feel like artists that, you know, you know, somehow a lot of artists, like, they're into it, but they're also, like, really at arm's distance, like, eight months yeah. ago. Totally. They're like, and now they're like, hey, Edgar, 
well, t- can you tell me about those? <laughs> <laughs> if I had a, if I had a penny for every time, or yeah, even penny for every time someone's like whispered that to me, like <laughs> I know you do NFTs, but don't tell anyone I'm asking you about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're like the NFT soothsayer. Uh, uh, I feel that. Well, listen, I'm going to round it out here, Edgar. I think you're so amazing. And I really, really appreciate your energy, your positivity, your artistic production. My God, you know, I can already tell you're a workaholic. Please remember for all your healing talk to take time for yourself. I can tell you even on your rest day, you're working on past. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. I'm about, I'm about to go to like turn off my phone, go on a hike in a little bit. So yes taking that to heart NATO and it's been such a joy to connect with you and to talk and I feel like we have so much more we could talk about so I really do hope that we can talk again in the future me too buddy I'm totally down so um thank you so much Edgar and let's let's catch up in person in RL and maybe cast a spell or two and be well you too take care and thanks everybody for joining thanks Sarah for making the everybody from I mean thanks for you guys for being part of the community you're awesome yeah (laughs) thank you everyone for being here you're awesome thanks guys Bye. Bye.